Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm main I've been maintaining the PreMRT kernel since 3.6.3.8 series. And I'm trying to present um, what pieces were there, which were mainline, when it happened, how it happened, and yes. It's the first time for me here for being at the current recipes. I'm very thankful. It's a very nice conference. So let me go on. Um, for RT, we use mostly cyclic tests and among other tools to, to test the system. So this is um, what the output generally looks like. Um, each column of lines um, represents a part of, uh, of something. Um, what Cyclita does is measures the wake-up latency. What it means is Cyclic test programs uh, every interval, like in this case 1,000 milliseconds, uh, 1,000 microseconds, for wake-up, and then it goes to sleep. When the actual wake-up happens, it measures the delay between the programmed wake-up and the actual wake-up time. And this is the wake-up latency. These are the orange numbers here, like minimum, average, and the maximum. Um, moving further, you can change the priority from the default get other, where cyclic test competes with every other task on the system, to being uh, with RT priority, to be preferred over every other um, task that is in the system. Um, this can be tuned further to the point where you have an interval of only 250 microseconds, and this on every CPU. Now, um, this what you see here is um, a histogram. So the wake-up times, as you he see here, those were um, almost 2,800 uh, uh, 2, cycles of 250 microseconds. So if you multiply those two, you know how long it ran. Um, this here has been running on normal preemptible kernel for eight hours. And on, at the bottom, you see the latency that was measured. And here on the Y side, it accounts how often a certain latency was measured. And as you see, the preemptible kernel um, had overflows greater than two milliseconds over 69 times. And the maximum was uh, over 20 milliseconds. In contrast to this, this is what um, the PreMRT kernel looks like. It's been the same workload. It's been, the only change that has been made is that the PreMRT option has been enabled. And as you see, um, the maximum latency went, in this case, only unto uh, 41 microseconds. Um, while preparing this talk, I pulled an old 2.8, 2.6.20-something kernel, like one of the first RT kernels we had, and the numbers were pretty similar, so I didn't put them up. It, the challenge here was to pull up a machine that compiled and was able to boot as such an old kernel. And so, the, the latency in worst case didn't change much over time. Um, this, in contrast, is what preempt versus preempt RT on the same machine for the same workload on the same base kernel version looks like. And what you notice here is that preempt RT uh, for the lower um, max latency, like for one and two microseconds, had way less samples than the non preempt than the non preempt RT kernel, like the vanilla kernel. The difference is um, what happens here, like how it ended up at the end, where RT stopped here and the, non, and the preemptible kernel went further and exceeded more. So from that point of view, what would you say we need um, to implement a preempt-RT system? Um, based on what we know today, this is more or less what we have, what we were looking for. So to be able to um, figure out the time, since you need to uh, make very close sleeps or figure out the time in high resolution, you needed a clock source and clock events to be able to figure out the time that we have, very high accurate, and to program and delay, like a sleep, uh, perfectly what we call in one-shot mode. Earlier, before we had all those infrastructure in place, um, we only had a tick, 
So every wake up was based on the value you had with config A to Z. And there was even not an infrastructure to make uh, sleep for one millisecond. What you had to do was to abuse the select with no FD and thus use the timeout option for the wake up. And if you look over a third of the system, you would prefer to have your RT task, if you have one, to, to be more important than the interrupt threads you have. Um, the more you use an RT system, you would like to have like priority inheritance and the scheduler is always an issue as we heard today again. And since the real-time task might uh, be huge and difficult, debugging infrastructure would be also important. Now, when would you like to start the RT project, like for real-time? Any guess? Okay, let me go on. Um, looking at all those requirements that I just put on for the 2.6 kernel, we didn't have any of those. Um, what improved compared to 2.4 was the scheduler. Back in 2.4, the scheduler had to look on each context switch across all the tasks in the system and decide which one to put on. Um, this improved um, for the 2.6 kernel. And to make it slightly worse, um, we got RCU also again at the time. The problem with RCU at the time was that in its read section, it disabled preemption. This, however, forbids to schedule a task like the RT task with a higher priority, which in turn means um, this looked like a blocker for RT in the 2.6 series. Nonetheless, the timeline looked like this. Um, late 2004, like um, 20 years ago, uh, Sven Thorsten posted the first series what could be an, an RT kernel. Um, this was a series of four patches with random features and what it led to was to um, debate how real-time with Linux should look like. Um, before that, however, there was certain project against um, 1.0 kernel for Linux, like um, where different approaches were tested. None of those were public on AKML. Um, between the 2.0 and 2.4 series, there was a, the CURT project. CURT is the Kansas University real-time Linux. This was um, a prototype which was running on 2.4 in the end, which was like a prototype how to um, how a real-time Linux could look like um, in the end. Um, if you look at the dates, after Sven posted uh, his patches, Ingo Molnar was uh, busy and posted a few days later uh, another version of his uh, voluntary scheduler. This was um, what we have today in the kernel, but it wasn't back then. It was still working on it. And after a few days, while he was working on his voluntary scheduler, he picked up the work on the PreMRT patch set. Literally, not, not even a week later. And the whole time frame, Thomas Gleixner picked it up even later. Now, feature-wise, what would we have? Logdep was one of the requirements. I remember back then Thomas and Ingo argued because Thomas' kernel was working, but Ingo's wasn't. And the root problem was that they had different hardware, and Thomas didn't run into the locking issues Ingo did. And this led over time to the locktop validator, as Stephen explained it today. Um, this was never in the RT patch first, so this was one of those upstream first approaches. Um, to, um, HR timer was one of those things we had in RT since um, the early days. And we had to program a timer which was highly accurate. And there was nothing like that in the kernel at the time. The timer list approach, was, which was Jiffy based, was the only thing that was available. Um, besides that one, there was the um, Dodge Anzinger attempt with, a, with high rest timers. And what Thomas presented, which was called uh, K-timers at the end. Um, that K-timers were a separate implementation, while the other things at the time tried to move in into the timer wheel, which didn't really scale. Um, another thing was Futex with priority inheritance. This applied, in the, this came up in the RT kernel, that's 
2.616 series and it also required the necessary glibc parts to make it work. It, it ended up upstream a little later, but this was already kind of uh, yeah great news because 2.616 for RT was like the first thing that RT was working in what you would call a productive environment. So people were starting picking this one and using it in real life products. Um, this is how priority inheritance works in general, but given that Stephen explained it today, I guess skip over it. Um, the next thing we had in RT was generic IRQ infrastructure. This was influenced back then what Russell had in ARM, and this was part of RT since early days, simply to simplify um, the threaded interrupts, which were also there. Um, Later on, we had clock events and clock source parts, which was mostly the same thing. And this was the other part that you had the timers highly accurate, but you also required to have the um, the wake up time also um, to read the clock source uh, accurate at a high resolution. So those two pieces belong together, were merged separately in later. And then thankfully, a few cycles later, uh, preemptible RCU appeared. So instead of disabling preemption in the read critical section as it was done before, it was possible to to remain preemptible. And you look at this, it appeared in 2.6.12 in the RT patch set uh, in the beginning. Um, before that, Ingo Molnar manually tracked each and one of the RCU section were in the kernel and replaced it with a read writable semaphore. And this didn't really scale because you had a lot of work to do to find a section, identify, place the locks properly. And if you look at the kernel today, there are thousands of RCU sections with nest into each other. So this work wouldn't scale. So the preemptible RCU done by Paul was really a saver here. Um, tracing was mentioned by Stephen again. Um, this showed up early as what it's ca uh, called the M count tracing utility. And the problem was, it was only the M count thingy. You had to recompile the kernel to enable and disable it. And then later, Stephen picked it up and made what we have in the tracing infrastructure later today with all those um, things. One thing that's worth noting is um, that the dynamic tracing feature that it went upstream broke the E1000. And this bug was very for a short time in the 2.627 uh, post merge window. So it, ne so it was only fixed in the stable tree. I added a link to LWN where it was explained how it happened and what were the features that required that, um, that it triggered. It was like, the code was good. We never had this bug in RT, but during the merge upstream, there were at least two safe nets which were removed for other purposes, and then this happened. Um, late October, we got threaded interrupts. Um, it was not very welcomed by all of the developers, but some of them said it is nice for developing because you could enable threaded interrupts, debug your interrupt handler, and if you do something wrong, this, the whole box would not crash and and you wouldn't get any output of it. So it was merged in the end in the two, uh, 2630. And then later we got the ROS pin lock T annotation. This was the first thing that was merged and did not have any benefit for the non-RT kernel. This is simply um, an annotation to distinguish the spin locks which spin on RT and those which don't spin on RT. And if you look at the version between 2.6 and 4.6, there's a huge gap. Mainly because most of the features before upfront that were merged um, had some kind of beneficial support for the non-RT kernel. After that, it gets tough. Um, 4.6, we had um, CPU hot blood rework. This was not working very well at the time in the kernel, but most people did not use CPU hot plug. Um, we started the testing, I think, during the 3.2 series, and because of other changes, RT blew up very frequently. 
So we started to rework the um, the hot plug, and mysteriously later on, the other problems disappeared as well. Um, we also had things like we decoupled page fault disabled from preempt disabled. And this was something that we needed for RT, but it was very hard to sell for the non-RT page, like why would we do it and sell it as a good reason? And we didn't have any. We had no reasons why this would benefit a non-RT. And this was in from the very beginning. So what happened was that the S390 folks at that time had a similar problem and complained about it. And then they got pointed to the RT tree, which had already a solution for it. So they picked the patches, argued on their behalf why this is required for the whole kernel because of S390, and then it got merged. So this then got, uh, was removed from the RT tree later on. Um, the non-cascading timer wheel um, was something that we didn't have in RT before, but having it improved the latency in general because the timer wheel back then was cascaded, which means the higher timeouts were in the outer tree. And every now and then, the kernel had to move timers from one tree to the other. With, and all those happens with disabled interrupts. And with the non-cascading timer wheel, all of the times um, the timeouts can be looked up uh, right away. And the cascading tire part where the timers are moved is not happening anyway. Um, the second T rework addresses um, a whole class of problems we had. And basically what happens is it's a sequence counter. And the way it works on non-RT, on vanilla, is that you have a, a lock and then you start your write sequence count. And the sequence counter is really in counter, which means if you start your sequence counter, S is an odd. And if S is odd, and then the other reader, which can only be on a different CPU, observes it and spins as long as it's odd. So the spin lock um, has two purposes. Purpose one is to ensure that there can be only one writer at a time. And purpose two is to disable preemption. And disabling preemption ensures that the other reader can only be on, observed on the other CPU. And that's why the whole concept works. Now, with RT on the other hand, the spin lock is preemptible. So what we can run into is that once we grab the lock and start a write sequence, that the reader can also preempt the task and spin indefinitely because there's no way of synchronization. So with the second T rework, what we manage in the end is to get the reader, acquire the lock which is already um, held by the writer and use the whole PI, the priority inheritance protocol to boost it out of its section so that the reader can uh, continue without deadlocking. Um, after that we had um, small pieces. My great disable was required, but um, the person that suggested it was um, Peter Zilsra himself. He also made an early design for it that we included in the 3.2 series. Um, the reason for my grade disable was the way that per CPU variables were utilized. And this was introduced in the 2.6 series the, at the very, very end. But we didn't um, have that many users that, that it was um, seen on the surface as a problem. Um, my great disable ensured that the task that is um, acquires a spin lock, for instance, remains on the CPU and is not migrated away. Um, this one was also tough to to sell initially, and it was one of the reasons why a CPU hot plug blew, uh, blew up on RT, because each and every spin lock was using um, my great disable, and if the CPU hot plug um, was not perfectly synchronized, then we had a deadlock during CPU hot plug. Um, during the series, um, there was a debate about HiMem, and Linus Torvalds liked the idea of migrate disable for, for HiMem reason on 32 bit. Like, let's punish the users on 32 bit with HiMem uh, for this implementation. 
and Peter Tilstra didn't like it at all, but then he was he sat down and implemented it from scratch again, which ended up upstream. Um, local log T is a log log, which is a per CPU log based on migrate disable. And initially we didn't want it to have it at all upstream. And we managed to rewrite all of the users one way or another. In the end, we had the MM folks and the C group department, which were completely against everything that we have thrown at them. So then those two de uh, departments were the actual reason why we ended up with local lock. And of course, print K. Um, ideally, in the beginning, print K wa wasn't really covered. We just disabled printing in atomic context and ignore it completely. And la later and later, more and more things uh, popped up, at which point in the 510 series, um, not early than that, we started working on Printgate, John Orkness namely. And he was busy on it ever since. Um, it started easily with um, all the pieces for it, like a design, how it should work, um, a Printgate buffer that is NMI safe, and so on and so forth. Now, this is mostly all of the issues. I skipped a lot, I guess, like over time where we were fixing bugs in individual drivers and whatnot. And so the question is, who is using RT right now? Anyone? Go ahead. Come again. Linux? The trading banks, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Lisa? Ah, oh, you shouldn't have said that. Okay, okay, okay. Now, this is um, a PLSC, a programmable logic controller. There are plenty of those. Um, in terms of cycles, you have the PLC. Um, this is this device. And then you have IOs on the right side. Um, you can stack them together, let's like a Lego, and you have inputs, outputs, and then you can read informations from outside, and then have your logic and decide what to do with them. Um, for those things, you have a maximum cycle of 150 milliseconds, but ideally you use less than that to be uh, responsible. and. The more stuff you add to it, the longer you need to query it again. Now, what to do with PLCs? This is another one from Kiba. This is used for injection molding. And as you see here, the cycles for the IOs is less. It's uh, barely 500 microseconds, which means you need to um, read the IOs, do your thing, and go to sleep. And the long and the longer the delay is, you wake up latency, the less time you have to do your computation and going to sleep. This is um, a LIGO model of an Angel Victory model. And the problem is that when I present here PremRT uh, products is that I have to gain on public knowledge. And this model was um, emphasizing that it's using Angel Victory for making the um, the Lego bricks, and this is the Angel Victory in real life. So in the end, you can say that the Kiba thing in, in the, at the at the at the front is used in this machine to control um, the molding, which in the end makes the Lego bricks. And then you have Prim RT in the middle. Um, a different example is from Kiba the Chemotion Robotics. Um, here the cycle times are slightly more relaxed. It goes up to 4 milliseconds. And it needs to communicate in that time with all those IOs and drive the motor. And one use case is painting. So it goes ahead and paints the whole car. And if you don't... Um, if you miss your cycle, and the problem that might happen is that the paint, you have more paint at one spot, not the other, or you just um, 
don't paint it accurately enough. Things that you see that you don't want to have, also you may use more paint than necessary. One thing that you don't want to have. Um, this is just a picture, but the links below uh, point you to the video online. This one. And you knows it? Trump. Come again? Right. Okay. So this is um, pub open. And this person looks inside. And that's how it looks inside Powered. So that's a laser. So you have Linux controlling it. And then you have energy coming up, energy coming out. And then you can start welding. So that's an uh, industry uh, case. So there is the machine with Linux running PreMRT and controlling the welding or, of something. Um, or a car doing manufacturing. So it needs to communicate over network and if it would miss its deadline, then you will see that the, um, that the welding parts are not accurate. The spots would be like further down or to the other side, which would not look good and maybe miss QA. Um, the things before more, more or less uh, program in advance. This is um, a camera which can be attached to the laser and that will be what it's looking like. So we have several bolts in the end. They are um, like in a circle and the camera comes from top, looks at it, adjusts it itself and then it puts the laser down f uh, for the welding. The important part is that Ideally, you, you need to um, sync with the object, which is not known. It can be different each time, so it has to adjust properly. Then you need to weld it. Tuck, done. And then you go to the next one. And ideally, the faster you go, the, the, slow, the, the smaller your cycle is, the more of those bolts you can do in, in one go, which will increase production time. But if you miss your cycles, then you wouldn't um, be able to do so. Um, this has been brought up as an um, RT use case. This thing is called Lisa. It has 128 inputs and outputs, and it's used for uh, special audio, like the concert with, um, yeah, uh, I'll get to it later. Um, you have like three milliseconds in total uh, for run trip latency where you um, prepare the audio and send it out. This is um, what the device looks from behind. And this is, there was a talk from the guys from L Acoustics which present um, how it works. Like um, they get metadata from one spot so they know how the, uh, how the event place looks like. So they can then um, pre-compute the, the audio data sent to each speaker because depending on where you stand, where the speaker is, it may maybe be different. And it's audio, which means if you have slight delays um, in computation and sending out the data, the thing that you, see, that you hear, like if you have two speakers and they are not synchronized properly, you hear it um, immediately. And that's what the speakers look like. Now, my last one. Anyone? No one. Come again? No, there's a person. The question was, is it autonomous? Now there's a person sitting in it. Okay. So first you grab the box. Then you throw the potatoes. The potatoes then go on a line, first in big groups, smaller groups, moving on. Yeah, and then we take a picture at the, in that corner you see the lightning going up. So that's where they take pictures of potatoes. Um, moving further, they get sorted, like where they have to go. And since they were pictures taken, they have also AI looking inside. 
So they try to approximate how good is that potato, and that one was bad, right? So then they go in sorting. And potatoes are huge, right? And you can do the same thing, um, but smaller, like berries. But the concept is the same. Like we have first the big group, small group, then you go for the picture again, look inside, and this is, I mean, all of those products are more or less um, exciting on different levels. The thing is that they manage to um, do the assembly sorting lines for, uh, for fruits from tiny to the big ones like melons. Um, that's like one of the use cases where you use um, AI with NVIDIA GPUs and so on. And they have cameras attached which, um, for, from the photo session. And they use 10G Ethernet to get all the data through. Most of the other cases I'm aware of, they have smaller Ethernet like gigabit or even less than that. But in this case, they need to get the camera data through. XTP is one of those use cases they use to get a low latency from where the packet arrives up to the, the program that needs to compute it. And with all the lanes, because one machine does not control, control only one lane, one machine controls several lanes, then you have several exits, which means you have several actors which um, control things in the middle. And this thing is going very, very fast. And again, if you miss a deadline, no one dies. However, um, you would, could end up, if you have like a bad apple or a bad fruit that you put in the wrong spot, then it might end up in the warehouse and then the warehouse might go bad. And this is something you would like to avoid. But um, yeah, so this was one of the impressive things I learned over the years. Now, are we done? Yeah, most likely, no. This was mentioned already, but um, yeah, let me go quick, quick. Um, Thursday, this is from last Thursday, Tuesday. Last, last week, Tuesday, PrintK was merged, which was the last brick on the road. Um, then Linus asked for the wrapped gold pull request. We handed over with the boat as asked for. Um, got it, looked at it. I think he complained that it wasn't all gold, but only wrapped in gold. However, it was merged in the end. So this is done more or less. But we're still not done. Um, PrintK has still things going on. One of the things is the, the console infrastructure that was merged. Um, not only we're trying to do um, merged atomic consoles that we need for, other departments like DRM and graphics um, were also exciting about this news. And as far as I'm aware, they try to make the blue screen of Linux happen. Like, maybe different color, but the same concept. Um, Steve mentioned that a few things are not merged yet. And this is true. Um, we got PreMRT support enabled or it's available with the coming up RC1. If you have config experimental, and if you own ARM64, x86, or even RISC V, um, PowerPC and ARM are still out of tree. And I had in the early days MIPS, but I lasted at some point, and no one complained, so I guess this remains. And um, so those are the things that we probably have to look into s since after the merge happened. And I don't think a lot of people know this, but around 6.0, I try to sneak a patch into PrintK to avoid printing on the consoles, which would avoid all those locking concepts that we have the problem with. And Linus threw it out and was not pleased. And from that point of time till now, it's not that I did nothing. We still have things that popped up over the, over the years. Um, where someone was looking at, at RT and was testing it and he ran into problems, like Arnaldo did with sick, uh, sick trap on Perf. Um, I, by doing the slides, I realized that it took me a year to address this problem from the initial report down to the merge. Um, other things uh, don't take that long. 
But this is like one of the things that probably go on over the years. Um, one thing I picked up one or two years ago was this thing with, um, change the way that local BH disabled works on RT. The problem is that it acts as a pair CPU BKL, like a big kernel log, CPU located. And I had, people had ideas over it how to address it. And I came up with something myself after I didn't have any um, problems in the long term. And networking merged the first part of the infrastructure. And networking, because networking was or is the biggest stakeholder in the whole bottom half story. So I thought if I convinced them with all BPF and XDP and everything else they have, then the other parts of the kernel wouldn't complain as much. So this is something to go on. For, um, the problem is that we have on our T is, um, if you look here, you have networking going on, then an interrupt occurs, um, which wakes the disk I.O. And then if you look at the priorities, disk I.O. has a higher priority than uh, networking that we had before. And what we have is um, that we do the PI boost, where we inherit priority, and then we go back to networking. And after networking is done, we go back to disk I.O. And this is just an example. This will go if you have like networking traffic and you have your FPGA driver for your real-time bus or whatever. Um, the idea that I intend to have is, the ideal solution is that you have networking, um, disk I.O. comes up, and then you have the sketch switch, and this soft interrupt runs in parallel, preempts it, and continues to work on. And once this is done, networking continues. So this is, yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, so uh, just, uh, just a little comment about like in the very beginning of your slides with the cyclic test, all the way back down, um, and you showed the interrupt interval of uh, 150 microseconds. So what it would do would be a wake up every 150 microseconds, or 250 microseconds and test, test, test. One day out of the blue, I just said, huh, I set the uh, dash I to, because um, that's microseconds, I think I set it to one million. So the interval was one second. The latency shot up tremendously. Anyone know why? I do, but. You want me to answer? Or? So you can answer. It was just, it was you're, asking, you're asking questions before. I was just wondering other people knew. Do so you want to ask questions back? Yeah, I'll ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> do you know why it went up, the latency went up when I set that to a million? Um, most likely because cyclic test isn't cash hard anymore. That's why we went here from 100 to 40. It after went up to, it, the latency went up into the milliseconds. But it's cyclic test as default, disabling all idle things and so on. Well, the answer was the CPU went to a deep sleep. But cyclic test disables it. No, it, it didn't back then. Ah. <laughs> that was new. I think I complained about that. I think that's why I added that. Oh, okay. So back, it was, it was years ago. I just said, yeah, what happened here? And I'm like, you know, uh, if the system goes into a deep sleep, I think that's when they added the uh, disabling of that. So, yeah, trick question. Okay. What, wait, wait, wait. What was it? Well, actually, the reason why I did bring that up is if you ever do real time, you actually do have to be aware of the power. Uh, some people like run all these tests and think, hey, the latencies are great. And then suddenly the system goes idle, not realizing that the power savings kick in. And then your you know, some event comes in and you're way late. And you go, oh, RT sucks. No, your hardware did. So. Yeah, there's still um, SMM and other things. I think with you, um, what is it called? There's one tracer looking for SMM interrupts. And I had, had um, server-grade hardware, which went to BIOS for one millisecond over one second period. So that's the hardware, uh, the HW LAT tracer, which also Daniel Bristot worked and added the uh, timer LAT and OS noise tracers that actually show all that as well. Yes, yeah. great work. Okay. Thank you.